I'm going to look at the topic of optimization, and optimization is an application of the extreme value theorem. Um, I'm not starting with optimization, so if you're here for that particular video, you might want to move the video forward until you get to the optimization notes. But first, I'm going to review this warm-up uh, because my students in my class are at, should have already done the warm-up before they started this video. So students in my class, we're going to review real quick um, linearization. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because hopefully in class you've already done this and you worked with your partners to figure out um, how to complete the linearization. This just gives you more practice. So in this problem, you are given a function, an exponential function of e to the 2x minus 1. Um, the first thing I'd like for you to think about, hopefully, is that, all right, this is an exponential function. So it would look something like that. That's going to be helpful because, as you know, concavity is one of the things that supports our work in linearization. Question number one, would the tangent line at x equal to 6 be above or below the curve? So job number one is I need the equation of the tangent line. Um, well, actually, I don't need the equation of the tangent line here. I just want to know if the tangent line would be below or above the curve. So really what this is about is the concavity, and I want to know is the curve going to be concave up or is the curve going to be concave down? Now, we just said that we know an exponential function is indeed concave up, so um, all tangent lines would be below the curve and any approximations would be too small. So I said, because f of x original is concave up, the tangent line is below the curve at x equal to 6, and that just supports what the conversation I already had. Certainly, if you were doing this on an assessment, uh, finding the second derivative would be very, probably really important to show that the curve actually is concave up. We're just kind of using our, what we know about exponential functions. Uh, letter B, based upon your answer to f of x, is f of x concave up or down? Well, I really, we really have already answered that. See, number one, the function, exponential function, is concave up. And letter C, would an approximation of f of 6.2 using the tangent line be too large or small? So now we are actually writing the equation of the tangent line, and we're making or letter D. And we're going to, here we're deciding if the um, approximation would be too large or small. So since the curve is concave up, tangent lines are below, approximations would be too small. So I say since f of x given function is concave up and the tangent line is below the curve, an approximation of 6 point, f of 6.2 using the tangent line of, to f of x at x equal to 6 would be too small. Now we're actually going to write linearization. So I'm going to begin with finding the derivative of my original function. I'm going to get my slope generator. I need to use the chain rule here. Remember the derivative of e to a power is e to the power times the derivative of the power. I'm substituting the x value of 6. Notice that I get an exact value. When I substitute 6, my slope is going to be 2e to the 11th. I do not need to grab a calculator and I do not even want to change that to a decimal approximation. So that's the slope of my tangent line. Get that out of the way. Here I am generating the y value. So I substitute 6 into the original function to get a y value of e to the 11th. So the point on the curve is x value of 6, y value of e to the 11th. So I have my slope, I have my x value, I have my y value. So I substitute into point slope form. There's my y value, my slope, my x value, getting y by itself. Notice I did not distribute the 2e to the 11th. I just added e to the 11th to the right-hand side. So that's a pretty direct linearization problem. But our purpose for this video is all about optimization. So as I said, optimization is an application of the extreme value theorem. Optimization it comes from, obviously, the word optimize. Now, normally when we think of the word optimize, we think of the most. But it may be best to optimize something to find the least. For example, if you owned a business, you would want to expend or spend the least amount of money possible by maybe getting 
the most product sold. So optimization can be the most or the least, and so that's where you get that idea for the extreme value theorem. If we're looking for the most, we're looking for the absolute maximum. If it's the least, we're looking for the absolute minimum, and that is why we are invoking the extreme value theorem. So in other words, optimization is simply a word problem that forces us to apply the extreme value theorem to determine the most or the least. So as a reminder, the conditions of the extreme value theorem are we must start with a function that is continuous on a closed interval, and the guarantee of the extreme value theorem is if we have a function that is continuous on a closed interval, there will be an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum on the closed interval. Now remember, an absolute max or a min, so right down here, well, let's add in the candidates like, who can apply for this position of absolute max or min? And we're going to always consider the endpoints, although you'll see in the optimization, the endpoints don't come into play very much. We're mostly focused, you'll see, on the critical numbers. The goal of optimization, basically you're going to be given a word problem, and your goal is to determine the, mac the maximum or the minimum of a quantity. Before we do a problem, I'm just going to walk you through the process. It's not a very difficult process, but a lot of times when we see word problems, we want to kind of shy away. So job, our uh, first step in the process, obviously, is to read the problem and identify the knowns and the unknowns, and if it's helpful, to draw a diagram. So in other words, when we were doing related rates, we would basically talk about our box of knowledge. So we are, again, anytime you have a word problem or a prompt, you're creating your box of knowledge. These are the things that I know, and also you're recording the things that I wish I would know. Number two, after you write down everything that you know and you figure out what you don't know, determine the quantity that you are trying to find the most of or the least of. This is really, really, really important because the quantity that you are maximizing or minimizing, this is going to be your primary equation. This is going to be the equation that gets all of the derivative action. Very important to know which one you're maximizing or minimizing. Now, why am I focusing on that? Because with these problems, you're often going to have more than one variable. And we're not going to do implicit differentiation here. It's not, these aren't related rates. We're going to need only one variable. So the problem will often give us information that allows us, it provides a secondary equation that we can use to get the primary equation in one variable. So in other words, that extra helper, sometimes I call it the helper equation, we need only one variable. So the helper equation will do just that. So let's go ahead and call it, instead. in addition to secondary, it's also, you'll hear me talk about it as the helper equation. And so when I need help, I go to the helper equation. And lastly, problem number four, this is where the calculus comes in. Find the derivative by setting the first derivative equal to zero or undefined to get critical numbers. And then we're going to use the second derivative. Also, we could also use a table of values. Use the second derivative to determine if that critical number is a local max, local min, which, well, we'll talk about that in a second. And then you're going to decide if your solution is reasonable or not. All right, so those are your steps. That's the process that you're going to follow to do the problem. So now that you have the process, let's just jump in and do some problems. Remember, the only thing that's different from the EVT is we have to read the information, get it all set up so we can get to a math problem. So let's learn how to read. One of the most important things is reading. Find two positive numbers. So right here, I'm already knowing these are my unknowns. I don't know what the two positive numbers are. I do know that if you take the two numbers and add them, you get 20. 
And if you multiply the two numbers together, uh, we're trying to get a maximum product, large product. So we want to maximize the product. So let's create the box of knowledge and the box of things I wish I would know. So over here, I decided to choose X to be represent the var as the variable for my first number and my first unknown. You could use any variable you want. I chose Y for the second number because I have two positive numbers. What do I know about them? I know that if you add the two numbers together, you get 20. And if you multiply, and my goal, let's, let's leave that for just a second. So that's my information, my factual facts. Now, what am I trying to maximize? I'm trying to get the largest product possible. So my primary equation, the one that I want to maximize, the one that I want to get the most of, I'm just calling it P for product. Nothing fancy about that. The product of the two numbers is X times Y. Notice that I have two variables. So seeing those two variables makes me very sad makes me very sad because I have too many variables. So I need help eliminating one of these two variables. So over here is my helper equation. So I can go from a sad face to a happy face. I can solve this equation for either X or Y, and it doesn't matter which one, so that I can eliminate one of the variables that I have over here. So I'm going to solve this equation for y, get y by itself, by subtracting x to the right-hand side. And then that allows me to take 20 minus x, substitute it in place of y, and then I will only have one variable. So that gives me a new, it's not a new equation, but a substituted equation. I have the first number is x. The second number is y, which is 20 minus x. I'm going to distribute the x to simplify my equation. 20x minus x squared. All right, so now calculus time. I have my primary equation. It has only one variable. Um, it's all cleaned up. So a little bit of calculus. Remember, we need to identify our critical numbers. So take the der first derivative. I get 20 minus 2x. To get critical numbers, I'm going to set the first derivative equal to 0. Solve for x by subtracting 20 and dividing by negative 2. And x is equal to 10. All right, I have an x value, but I need help. Listen to what I said. I need help getting the y value. So if I need help getting the y value, I go to my helper. Whoops, went too far. I substitute. 10 in place of x, and I find out that y is also 10. So the two numbers that maximize the product are when x is equal to 10 and y is equal to 10. All right, now remember, we're going to make sure that that x equal to 10 is a maximum. So to verify, I'm going to use the second derivative test. So here, I'm going to Find the second derivative. Second derivative, in this case, is a constant negative 2. So second derivative is negative 2. I'm going to take my critical number, which I got right here, x equal to 10. I'm going to substitute it into the second derivative, which I really can't because it's the second derivative is negative all the time. But I can show that I'm considering it. Second derivative at 10 is negative 2. Therefore, since I have a critical number and I output a positive, negative number in the second derivative, I have a max occurring at x equal to 10. So I know what some of you are thinking. What about the endpoints? Well, think about it. If we're going to do two positive numbers from uh, that add to be 20, then we can have digits from 1 to 20. So if the minimal value, the, the first endpoint would be if x is 1, y would be 19, and that does not maximize the product. 1 times 19 
is 19, but 10 times 10 is 100. If I choose, uh, well, actually, I can't even choose 20 because um, it's two positive numbers. So it's really the, the largest value that I could substitute would be 19. And we've already proven that that does not work. All right, let's take a look at another example. Oh, my sentence, my sentence. Very simple, just tell me, what did they tell you to do? The two numbers that maximize the product are 10 and 10. All right, we're gonna look at problem number three. Find the dimensions of a rectangle with perimeter 100 feet whose area is large as possible. So what are we trying to maximize here? Good, we're trying to find, maximize the area. What is our helper equation? Correct, the perimeter. So the perimeter is the helper and area is going to be primary, meaning that we're trying to maximize the area. So let's record our box of knowledge. I drew a rectangle and I gave it dimensions of X and Y. The variables really don't matter. X and Y are pretty easy to use. So let's look at my information and secondary equation. I said X is the length of my rectangle. Y is the width of my rectangle. And the perimeter equation is 2X plus 2Y equal to 100. So there's where I'm using the perimeter equation. That's gonna be my helper. And I'll decide uh, when and where. You also hopefully see that I can divide everything on both sides by two and make x plus y equal to 50. I'm wondering if I did that. Yeah, not yet. Okay, next step, we gotta start the act, the real work. So we start with our primary equation. What is the area of this rectangle? Yes, it's x times y. How many variables do you see? Correct, two variables. That's one too many, so I'm going to need help in eliminating one of those two variables. Where do I go if I need help? To the helper equation. So I'm gonna get one of the two variables by itself. It doesn't matter which one. I've chosen in this case to get y by itself, so I subtracted 2x from both sides, divided everything on both sides by 2, and that gives me 50 minus x. So now I can take the 50 minus x, and I can substitute it in place of y. Whoa, my pen's going crazy here. So let's do that to get one variable. There it is. I've substituted 50 minus x in place of y. Notice this is basically the same problem we did before, but now we're looking at a rectangle versus just integers. Distribute, algebra one, calculus time, find the first derivative, 50 minus two x. Calculus time, set that equal to zero to get critical numbers. Solve for x. Critical number, x equal to 25. We're trying to maximize the area, so I'm gonna check that critical number and find out whether or not I get a max or a min. So I'm going to begin by finding the second derivative, and then I'm gonna substitute my critical number into the second derivative for the second derivative test. The second derivative of a is negative 2, just like last time, substituting 25, I get negative 2. Therefore, when I have a critical number substituted into the second derivative and I get a negative, I get a maximum at x equal to 25. So yay, because I was trying to maximize the area. Now I need help getting a y value. So whenever I need help, I go to the helper equation. So I'm gonna take 25, which is my x value, substitute it in here. 25 minus 25 is 25. I mean, 50 minus 25 is 25. So I get a y value of 25, meaning 
that if you want to maximize the area of a rectangle, go with a square. A square is a rectangle. A square is a rec special case of a rectangle. And if you want to maximize the area, a square maximizes the area of a rectangle. And then finally, my sentence is... The dimensions of the rectangle are 25 by 25 that maximize the area. Let's do one more. I think it's just one more. Let's make sure. Yep, and then you got homework. Okay, here we go. Get to live. We're going to step it up a little bit here. This is on page eight, problem number six. A cylindrical cylinder, a cylindrical can is to hold one liter or a thousand cubic centimeters. So this is your clue that this is dealing with volume because volume is measured in cubic units. How should we choose the height? So we're trying to find the height and the radius, which is R. And this time we're minimizing the amount of material. So amount of material students is the surface area of the can. A lot to think about here. So the first thing I'm going to do, hopefully, under my box of knowledge, is I'm going to draw myself a, yay, I did it. I'm going to draw myself a cylindrical can to look at and to think about. Um, I'm trying to minimize surface area. So let's think about that for a second. If I'm trying to minimize the surface area, the surfaces of a can are the top, so that's a surface right there, the bottom, which is another circle, so that's a surface right there. So how do I find the area of a circle? Of course, pi r squared. So that takes care of the top, but I also have a bottom circle, so I have two of those circles, two pi r squared two areas of circles that are same dimensions. The, the, um, the other part of the surface area, so I have to add to that, is like, think of it like the label. If you pull the label off a can, think about what would happen if you took the label off of a can. So the label of a can, even though it's around a circular object, if you take that label and lay it flat, guess what you get? Yep, a rectangle. So this part of the rectangle right here, this part of the rectangle, is actually the circumference of the circle right here, corresponds. Let's see, maybe we'll do that in what color? Green, that might stand out. All right, so this, this circumference of the circle right here is actually the length of the rectangle. So circumference of a circle is 2 pi r, and then this distance right here is the height of the rectangle, that's h. So the area of this rectangle is 2 pi r times h. So we're going to add that to the top and bottom circle, and that, believe it or not, is the equation that we want to minimize. So that's my primary equation. I just want to show you where it comes from. This would likely be given on an assessment, but I think it's important to, to understand. It's not magical. It makes sense. All right, what else did they tell me? They told me that the volume of the um, can and the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared h, they said that is 1,000 cubic centimeters. So I'm setting 1,000 equal to the volume, just recording all the information that was given. Um, and so up here you can see, look, the variable of R, variable of R, variable of H, boo, I have too many variables. So I'm going to come back. I need help eliminating one of the variables. And right here is my helper equation. So 
since this term right here has an R, this term has an R, this one has an H, I need to get rid of that H right there. Meaning, I need to solve this equation for H, getting H by itself. So to get H by itself, I'm going to divide both sides by pi R squared. So I can substitute 1,000 pi R squared in place of this H right here. When I do, okay, that gets rid of that little box. When I do, this is just algebra, so don't be afraid. I copied the 2, the pi, the r squared, plus 2 pi r, and then I replaced, using my helper, I replaced h with 1,000 over pi r squared. So notice that when I do that, now I can divide this pi with this pi, pi pi. <laughs> um, I can divide this r with one of these right here. And so I'm left with 1,000 over r times 2. Go slow. It's just algebra. This isn't calculus. So I multiply 2 times 1,000. I brought the r that was in my denominator to the numerator to get a calculus ready, because we're going to take the first derivative. And now calculus time, I'm going to take the first derivative, 4 pi r, power rule, negative 2,000 r to the negative 2. Okay, now the r to the negative 2, we're going back to algebra time. Calculus is over. So we're going to set the first derivative equal to 0, and in order to solve, I'm going to bring the variable back down. Well, I did not yet in this problem. But eventually, I think I did. I think I can. I think I did. Um, I'll bring the r back down to the denominator. I added the 2,000 r to the negative 2 to the left-hand side. And now I can cross multiply, however you want to think about it. I can put a 1 there and then cross multiply, which will give me 2,000 equal to 4 pi r cubed. Divide both sides by 4 and pi. 2,000 divided by 4 is 500. Pi in the denominator. To get r by itself, I'm going to take the cube root of both sides. I did not write it as cube root. I wrote it as one-third power just because it's easier to type. So 500 over pi to the one-third is r. And I'm going to leave it as an exact value. All right. Now, before we find the h value, let's, or maybe that's what I did. I don't know if I test, tested the second derivative. Yeah, I did. No, I didn't. What did I do there? Oh, I found the, so, all right, so finding the h value, I'm going to substitute my h value from over here was 1,000 over pi r squared. So I'm going to substitute 500 over pi to the one-third power in place of r. So 1,000 over pi. I'm substituting 500 divided by pi to the one-third power. And so when I have a power to a power, I get to the two-thirds power. And I guess eventually I did um, use my calculator to get that to be 10.839. Because in this problem, they wanted the value of h. So my sentence is, in order to minimize the amount of the material, the radius should be 5.419 centimeters and the height should be 10.839. So I did go to the calculator to get those decimal values. All right, so this is just for this is just three problems, same process. And I know right after this one you're thinking, oh my gosh, this is crazy ridiculous. It really is not. Um, you may have to go slow, but they are doable. And I'm not going to give you many to do tonight. So for your homework tonight, you are if you're in my class, you're looking at 265. 4, 6, 9, 11, 19. So you're looking at five of these and you have any remaining time in class to go ahead and start on those working with your classmates.